What's the deal, family man? Welcome back to the channel, bringing you the realest and the rawest reactions. Today, we got another banger for y'all, man. So, look. We got Kev Mac. 3, 2, 1, man. Y'all remember Kev Mac videos, man? Uh, we got Monster Cody. 8 Trey Gangsta Crips. Already about to run this one up right here, man. Uh, look, bro. If y'all don't know who Monster Cody is, man. Monster. Cody Scott, a.k.a. Monster, a.k.a. Sanyika Shakur, man. He actually wrote a book called Monster. And that's one of the first and still to this day, one of the few and only books I ever really read front to back. Bro, I read that book in, uh, was it middle school? I read it in middle school. I didn't finish it. And then I read it again in high school and I finished it. Uh but man, one of my favorite books of all time. Really, like any, I feel like anybody should read that. Like every, everybody should read that. You don't gotta be an LA dude. You don't gotta be a gang member. You don't gotta be somebody who who just wants to, you know, hear the stories of a gang member. You don't gotta be somebody who got ties to the streets or nothing like that. Anybody can read that book and get value from it, hundred percent. And I recommend everybody read it. It's the only book I double back on. And really read like paperback, not audio book, none of that. Really read front to back one time, but went back, double back on it twice. So, uh, we're gonna check this out, man. I've seen some videos of him, but I don't think I ever actually watched this one. So, my homie, my boy, uh, my boy Bad Plex sent me this. So, he said react to it. So, we're gonna react to the series, man. It's four parts, they're all about 30 minutes. So, I'm gonna do uh, a different part each week. Be on the lookout for that, man. Let's get straight into this, though. Oh yeah, that's the book right here. That's the cover right here. at age 11 on the day he graduated from the sixth grade. That night, he says he was given a shotgun, and for his initiation, he pumped eight rounds into the ranks of a rival gang. Who's you know, that engagement? Kill or be killed, you know? You say it's a war. Who are the sides? Who's fighting who over what? If it's a war, asking for nothing other than the destruction of human beings. The, the end result is to create funerals. As many souls as you can drop on other side is considered um, success. Well, my name is Sanyika Shakur, uh, Monster Cody, Cody Scott. Uh, I will tell you one thing, bro. The gay he is from, very, very dangerous, bro. Very dangerous. My homie, one of my homies who repped that, man, he locked up right now for catching a couple. You know what I mean? Very dangerous. It's not, there's, there's, there's all, there's tons of gangs in LA, but there's, a, there's few that are here and there that are reputable to the max, to the, to the highest extent, have a lot of history behind it. A Trey is one of those gangs that have a very long, very long, uh, and insane, just crazy history today, uh, today gang, man. 56 year old, long standing member of the Crips. I'm at the north side of the H. First generation A Trey. I founded the North Side of the A Trey Gangster Crips in 1980. Um, I've been a combatant in that war, which catapulted me to local stardom, celebrity status in our area, South Central, from just basic atrocities. You know what I mean? Nothing that really 
you know, you know, cause me to think or sit down and solve a problem. I always was adding on to the problem. So, you know, we'll get to that, but I was one of them dudes, you know what I'm saying, front line. And, uh, but I learned from cats. I, I, I didn't just materialize out of thin air. I didn't fall from the sky. I was produced by a certain climate. Damn, I like how he said that. I didn't just materialize out of thin air. I learned from cats. I was produced. And that's what happens. You, are, you get produced to be a gangbanger, bro. You get produced to be put into the streets. You could almost say you get uh, you, you get produced to do these things just based on the environment that you're in and the people that you're around and the type of energy that you portray. That makes people want to say, you know what, come rock with us. If I'm going to be honest, bro, when I was real young, how old was I, 13, 14? I was like 13 or 14. I had a homie who was trying to put me on rolling 60s. If you know about Monster Cody and Rolling Sixties, they're mortal enemies of the A-Trade Gangster Crips. My homie was trying to put me on Rolling Sixties when I was 14. I decided I wasn't trying to go that way. But if I had, the whole trajectory of my life would have been completely different. And I would have been a product of the streets or a product of the environment. Simple as that in a certain area, in certain dirt. Man, in the tropics of destitution, this is where I was produced, which is where other plants before me were produced. Thanks. And just, we just came up as cactuses, and then we didn't need much what everybody else needed. You didn't have to water us, but every three years, I mean, we just existed in a fucking desert of nothing, but just poverty and just our elders not overstanding that just something was going on with us as a people. We couldn't articulate it. I don't think the cats before us could because the way they reacted, it was not just in rebellion to the system and the pigs and the whole American thing, but it was also in rebellion to the Panthers who had established something that was about unity. So these young cats, the Keyways, and then eventually the Damus, these was now the front line vanguard of me. This is where I was looking. When they was looking at maybe Huey or Bunchy Carter or Craig Munson, Craig Credit, Cats from the East, Raymond, before him and two hooked up. Raymond Washington. Man, who I am, man, is a product of all that. So in 1972, December, my mother moved from the Crenshaw District to 69th and Dinker. And it's something about this area, man. This is just a dynamic area. This whole little area, I'm talking about between man and man, this is just a dynamic area. This whole little area, I'm talking about between Manchester and Slauson, between Crenshaw and Normandy. It's something about this area. Out of this one area, five people have written books. Five people have written books out of this area. Crenshaw but District. Not just that. Out infamous. of this area on the west side of South Central. Connect the streets to Florence and Normandy. This little area right here was really the command center of the west side Crips. My uh my pops grew up on Florence and Normandy, man. Uh, right where that where the riots took off at. I believe that's the same spot. Uh Florence and Norman. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly, Florence and Norman is exactly where my pops grew up. My, uh, my fucking, uh, <laughs> my Aunt Shirley, man. My Aunt Shirley, rest in peace, man. She stayed at that, she never leave that house, man. As much as her, as much as the whole family wanted to move her out from over there, man, she would never leave, man. That was home to her. That was home to her. That's where my pops grew up. And, uh, Man, I used to love visiting her. <laughs> I used to love visiting her, man, but that's that's a, that's an area with a lot of history behind it, for real. St. Andrews Park was the center of the West Side Crips. St. Andrews, the, yeah. We, the H-Rays inherited that. 
this shit that the HOA got, that we got now, that we've been fighting 60s for, for 40 years, man. We inherited the war with the 90s was inherited to us through our relations with the Hoovers, but also as a consequence of us claiming St. Andrews Park. St. Andrews Park never got along with Sportsman Park. The Sportsman Park boys was the enemies of St. Andrews Park. So Tookie, Cukes, Rusty, Mouse, Todd, Chucky Madison, Gary Lane. I mean, these dudes was using their whole names. I mean, these dudes was like rambunctious, serious giants. This is what I inherited. This is who I am. So my mother moved us to 70, in 72, she moved us to, to 69th Dinger. And I'm seeing these cats. I'm seeing Rusty hit the corner every day. I'm seeing Cutes hit the corner every day in 64, Riviera. With the truck lights under the wheel wells, with the wheel well painted white, with the Kragers, the little 20s and him leaning with the 8-track, probably holding it with his hands so he, so he can keep the same song going. But, but just that visual. You see how boys in the hood or men's society slow shit down when they, they see a gangster walking in the, or the news will slow you down when they want to make you look particularly atrocious. Like they'll, they'll say, today, Cody Scott murdered 12 people and was captured. But they'll show me coming out of court and I'll be saying to my wife, hey babes, I'll talk to you tomorrow. But they'll slow it down there and it'll look like this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do be doing and that. They'll though. be saying, and Cody Scott killed 12 people and he's been captured. You see it? They'll make you so your visual ain't lining up with what you're hearing, but the hearing is more evil. And the way you're going, you can't be saying nothing cool. Look at your face. But they slowed the footage down and you look like you're frowning, but you're just really passing the love note. What I'm saying is, Perception. Point a point of view, right? Yep, perception, yep. Fact. The point of view from which I got of seeing these cats was like a jump for me from uh, World War II movies that was popular at that time when I came up. Rap Patrol, uh, 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 Combat with Big Morrow. Those are the dudes I wanted to be like because they was rough and tumble dudes, but I only seen them on TV. And then before them, the bullshit cowboy movies, the genocide movies, you know, with John Wayne swaggering his ass up in there. John Wayne swaggered his ass up in some shit, and this motherfucker's just got testosterone all on the walls and shit. Right? I mean, this motherfucker, this motherfucker was leaking man. Right? But that's the image they wanted to portray of the American people, American male at that time. So that's where I got my, my, my whole get down of what it was like to be upright, to be, you know, not just able to do it, but able to protect people too. Cause I never liked bullies, man. I never liked, I never liked the bullies, right? Cause I was being, at that time I was being bullied. So explain to me who were some of the older. See, it's crazy. Cause a lot of people will question like why people gotta act so tough. Why people gotta be so much of this and so much of this and act so hard and do all that. It's because it's a protective measure against your environment. If your natural environment is dangerous, if your natural environment preys on the weak, if your natural environment says, in order for you to survive out here, you gotta be able to do this, that, the third fight, be able to, you know, do this, don't be scared or nothing, like all of that, what you gonna do? You either gonna you either gonna fight or you or flight. It's fight or flight. So it's either you you say, okay, let me adapt to this environment and move how I gotta move it. Let me make sure I walk in a way where ain't nobody gonna feel like they could just jump me and take my money. Let me make sure I'm talking in a way where people understand that I ain't no square and I ain't scared of nothing. Let me make sure I, I, I uh, let me make sure I got this on me in case they do think I'm square or I'm a punk or something. I got something to show them that I'm not. And that's just survival tactics of the environment you go in, or you go into flight mode and you gotta. And then at that point, you gotta. You know, it's like you hiding from the police or something. You duck in cover mode. You you going, you taking the, the, the three hour walk home versus the twenty minute bus ride home because you you try to go around all the spots you know you're gonna get jumped at. You know, you gotta you gotta do this and do that. So both of both of them is gonna push on your mental health a little bit in different types of ways. And both is gonna tug on your character and, and your your identity of who you are as as a man growing up as a kid growing into a man in different types of ways as well. 
some it might not be the most healthiest thing, but some people got to act one way to survive, whether it's this way or that way. What crips you looked up to in your your area when your mom's moved? Well, old. yeah, I moved into I moved into the fucking I moved into fucking uh, uh, central casting for what today is the prototypical. What today is. Uh, the archetypical gangster. I moved into that, and that was just the norm. And, and these cats, but they had their own style. They wore leather like the, the Panthers, but they really wasn't about black power. These dudes out getting pussy. These dudes was carrying guns. They was just doing what they wanted to do. They were outlaws. They were outside of the law, and that's what the appeal was. So when I came from them bullshit ass movies and all that, and actually move there and would be in the front yard and cues them be up and down the street or they'd be chasing brims or brims would be chasing them up and down dinker. I mean, it just, but, but they would do it with style and finesse, man. So they became the real deal. And fuck being like somebody on TV I, that I ain't even the same color as. I want to be like the dude who's the real deal. Do you remember some of those brims names? Oh yeah, Yogi, Terry Cadeau, uh, his brother, uh, uh, that son of a bitch. He, he really wasn't in the bank, but he used to, he used to really uh, support him a lot. I, I'll think of his name. Oh, Touche, uh, Michael Silverstein. You know, these dudes are uh, fucking Foots, fucking uh, Rat, the Twins, son of bitches. Even, you know, <laughs> like, here's the thing, man. I, I came into the Crips, so I, I was fortunate enough, man, to, to be pollinated like that, man, and I was fortunate enough that that righteous ass fucking butterflies and fucking bees fucking landed on me, man, and pollinated me, man, cross pollinated me. And I was able to rub shoulders with giants, man, because I learned how Crippin is and how it, and everything changed. I ain't no stuck dude going back talking about let's take it back to the days because the good old days was really the bad old days. Every day has their good days and every, every time has their good and bad days. There wasn't no good old days all the time. You know, the, the mother of invention is, necessity is the mother of invention. If you need it as a human, with all this knowledge and prehensile and holding thumbs, we will create it. I need to see people in a box running through a fucking electrical cord, through a copper cable. I need to control that. Now, they didn't know all that then, but when that dude walked up to them and said, I'm going to build this thing called a television, they said, get the fuck out of here. You're going to put people in a fucking box, put the fucking cord in the wall socket, and then run an antenna on the roof to show it? <laughs> <laughs> and then run an antenna on the roof to show it? God damn, you got my money. <laughs> Hey, bro, kill me with that voice right there, though. Bro, I need some lotion, man. He need that, he need that Palmer's, man. He need that Palmer's bad. I ain't even gonna hold you, man. You need that Palmer's. You definitely gotta get rid of that Dasani over here, bro. You gotta get you some. You gotta get you some better water, man. Ah, Dasani, it's alright, it's alright. It's alright. Right. I'll let you. I'll let you. I'll let you slide with the Dasani, man. But <laughs> you definitely, you definitely need some Palmer's, though, man. I'm out of here, Jim. Now, today, they got TVs fucking thin as my phone. You feel me? Fucking big as this fucking patio. What I'm saying is, if you need it, you'll produce it. So, street organizations where I was from, gangs, fulfill the need. The Panthers have been wiped out. And these brothers and sisters, everybody always say, may have been Panthers. That's true or not true. Exactly. Well, I tell you what they were. They were tired of the bullshit. Facts. And the way they responded to it by creating this super gang, which they never thought was going to be a super gang, it was just cats doing their thing. That's what people don't understand about history, man. History ain't plotted out. That ain't the part that's going to make history when you plot that shit out. History is spontaneous, man. It's made by the masses every day. Small shit that you never hardly hear about. But we're hearing about more because now we take knowledge, you know, not knowledge to Mature. And, and I apologize, man, for, for straying off again, but man, it's been so long since I've been able to talk. 
Oh, it's all good. So, Tiki. Bro, I love the way his mind worked, though. That's why That's why when I first read the book, I, I, I loved it. I just didn't finish it. Came back, I had to go back again because the way his mind worked when he speak on things, and it's even more impressive in this video than, lo, than in the book, low-key, but the way that his mind worked, man, like he a real... He's very thoughtful and a real educator and a teacher, but not about just gangs, about life. And he takes the gang stuff and the street stuff and he compares it to life. Or you can even say he takes life and compares it to the street stuff because that's his better way to understand it and comprehend it. Sometimes you got to meet people where they at. Not where you at, but you got to meet them where they at. And sometimes that and then that information is going to stick that much more. Tell, tell me how and when you met Tookie. Tookie, big. I first met Tookie in 76, man. And, um, this is before he moved on 69. His father, his stepfather, always lived there. And uh, he was a What a lot of cats don't know, all the OG gang, gang members and shit, all the OGs, bro, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and all that shit. Um, big, bro, hitting the weight, bodybuilding. Now all the gang bangers be mad skinny. They be little twigs because all they got to do is boom, 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 boom. They don't really got to, they don't got to thump no more. So they be all skinny and that's the, you know, trying to run fast. They got to run away from bullets. So they got to be skinny and quick. They got to be able to turn to the side and get and not get hit. You, 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 you looking like this, bro. You a target. <laughs> but back then, that's what it was. All my uncles, bro. Especially the ones that was running the streets and shit like that. All my uncles. All of them. Boom. Boom. Bodybuilding, you know, hitting the hitting the uh hitting the weights, bro. All that. All that. Huge, bro. Cause that's just how you had to be able to thump. That's just what it was. Photographer. And then huge and his mother lived around the corner. And not not his mother, but you know, not Q's mother. Um, took his uh, mother had the dog thing. Remember, she had the the, the kennel uh, in Compton. So Took was doing that at that time, and um, he came over here with Jack, and uh, from the east side, who became his roommate eventually. And they asked me uh, where Took's father was, stepfather was, and I said I didn't know. But they had a red '64 Chevy for Lou Took. He was finna get out of YA. And um, they asked me what I thought about the car. I said, I thought it was cool, man. So I rode off, I was on my bike. That was the first time I ever really met him. But I already, I already knew, his, I knew who he was by sight, by his shape, you know, by just the way people were around him. You know, he just, and, 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 he, and his thing about Tookie, Tookie never was like the leader. He just was just one of the hardest motherfuckers. <laughs> and motherfuckers was just on that level getting hard. Yeah. So who else better to emulate than the hardest motherfucker there? But took he, he himself was emulating Craig Munson. The thing was to try to be a giant. Craig Munson. The thing was that when I hit you, that's over at Venice Beach. That's where, that, bro. When I, t bro. So <laughs> maybe all, uh, maybe all this will come out eventually one day. You know, when I got a bigger fan base or something. But all my uncles that I was talking about, they used to bodybuild. They used to be at Venice Beach, bro. Bodybuilding with Craig Munson. Bodybuilding, uh, uh. Bodybuilding with Tookie, bodybuilding with Craig, bodybuilding with uh, CT, all them cats, bro. That's all my, my uncles used to roll with all them cats. Now, I ain't going to say roll with them, but they used to all be up at Venice Beach uh, doing they, doing their stuff, man. At uh, Muscle Beach, getting their lifts in, doing all that. That's the place where all these dudes from different hoods could come together and just be on some workout type of stuff. And ain't no issues, no problems. was at the old school Muscle Beach, bro. Real talk. True story. I wanna knock you out. I don't got time to be fighting with you all day. My biscuits is shined up. My, my, I got my creases in, I got the vest on. You know what I mean? I got my ace deuce, I got the motherfucking, it's hooked up. I ain't got time to be fighting with you. I got this long cross earring in. When I hit you, I'ma knock you out. <laughs> so in order for me to do that, I gotta lift weights. Uh, so Tukey was the, the, the prototype of that for us, but he himself was, as we all overstand, right? Tukey used to have a big old picture of Sergio Olivia, and it, a Cuban brother oh, who won Mr. Olympia. First brother ever to do it, an African Cuban. And uh, 
Yeah. So everybody had something to look up to, man. But um, so but but you had Tukey, right? But Tukey wasn't all wasn't the biggest. There was other cats bigger than Tukey, but they didn't have the whole package. Bigger than what? Reputation or size? And size. No, 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 no one bigger than and then rep. See, once the rep is established, then that's what you you ride on, right? And then more not more times out of ten. When you, when you approach, people are approaching you based on your rep. So that, that floats you for a while, but Tookie's like cutes, like all of us. The rep ain't cool, I, I need to fight every day. So that's how Tookie was. He just pull up and just want to fight a motherfucker. You know what I mean? So he, he wasn't always the biggest, but he had the whole total package, the whole charisma, man. Look, bro, and I'm not saying this because I'm Keyway and Took is a Keyway. I knew him personally, but he was star quality, man. Just like Mouse. These these cats, man, if in any other lane in this country, if freedom existed, these dudes would be who everybody would be. These dudes would be our Billy D. Williams. They would be our James Earl Jones. These dudes, I'm talking about the total package. Intelligence, wit, charm, unbridled sexuality. Um, physique, looks, teeth. I mean, these dudes, no tattoos. They didn't have to do none of that. They didn't have to, look, when you see these dudes, they might just do something as esoteric as this. Just throw their wing out on you. <laughs> Ain't nobody seen this but you and this dude. But he just did flexed on you. Yeah. Now it's about Bertie Swan and going to Long Beach and catching him at the Long Beach arena for the uh, Parliament Funkadelic concert. We're going to break on him. Come out on him, Tookie. Break on him, Tookie. Break on him. That's what Big Jack would say. Break on him, Tookie. And Tookie would come out of his shit. No tattoos, waist this small. Come out like this, man. I mean, I'm a, just a giant of a dude. Handsome. Big old natural. At the height of health. Taking no supplements or nothing, man. Man, Tookie would do this shit. All boys to the side on the set. Real warrior shit. Real warrior stuff, bro. Like not on some like let me let me get fully blasted, be mad skinny. I'm halfway a drug addict, but I'm oh, but I'm a gangster out here. I'm ha I'm halfway a drug addict. Uh, tattoos, whatever. You got tattoos, you don't got tattoos, whatever. It is what it is. But I'm halfway a drug addict. I'm skinny. I'm not in shape. At least I'm skinny. I'm skinny, but I'm not in shape. I ain't got no muscle. I can't fight. None of that. But I'm oh, I'm super gangster out here, cause I got I got that thing on me. I got a couple of them things on me. You know what I mean? And it's like, nah, that ain't no real warrior. That's real warrior stuff. Like he's saying qualities, the qualities he's talking about are qualities that any man should, to an extent, should want to have. You should be physically physically strong. Uh, take care of yourself, whether it's in the face, whether it's in your hair. Take care of yourself. Make sure your looks is, you know, you looking right for the for the females. You know, make sure your your physique is there, you know. Make sure you strong, you take care of your, you know, work out. Make sure you got charisma, you funny, you know how to speak to people. And make sure you intelligent. These are all good <laughs> qualities every dude should want to strive to have. That's what he's talking about. None of the other stuff like, oh, man, he got the gun. Oh, man, he got the, he be off that lean. He be off them drugs. Like, none of that. That ain't necessarily qualities you want to chase. People go up to the liquor store and buy them. A half pint of chocolate milk. Go right around the other aisle and get a little box, a little packet of yeast. He take the yeast and eat the yeast and drink the chocolate milk on the way back home and say, "I'm finna go out to, to the house and blow up like bread." And he he start lifting because it was my job to stack the weights. Me, Harv, little Harv. Um, Tray ball. It was our job to stack the weights. So if he say he doing arms that day, we get the arm shit out. Dumbbells. You know how the whole front room took his whole front room was no furniture, all weights. That cute. I mean that um, uh, you know, the other homies had went around and, and, and taken from areas and people. So took his whole front room was weights. You want to sit down? You sit down on a stack of fifties, or you sit down on that crate. But in that crate, it's like a dang gang of dimes and mirrors and a crate with a box with a speaker in it that was hooked to 
a line and went to the back. It was supposed to be an eight track, but it only played four songs, a four track. So they played four songs over and over all day. Girl Call It by Chocolate Milk. Reach For It by George Duke. Happy Feelings by Frankie Beverly and Maze. And Go Away Little Boy by Marlena Shaw. Now this song here made it into the repertoire because Big Jack took his roommate, who's an OG Eastside Crip, swole at the top, but he had little bitty chicken legs. That's the homie, but that was his weakness. He had the proverbial despicable me body. <laughs> like, uh, despicable me body. body. <laughs> you know, people, before people start working on their legs, overstanding that the legs is your foundation. And I'm getting off this, man. I'm gonna start, <laughs> look, hey, bro, look, look, hey, yeah, hey, look, so hey, I'll push your side, y'all, look. Hey. Man, I'm so happy to be out. Don't be out here with no skinny legs. Big old, big old, just looking like despicable, <laughs> despicable me. <laughs> oh, built like despicable me, man. The whole Don't do week. that. I'm so happy to be out South confinement. I'm so happy to be back on the main line. Because when I, I mean, man, bro, I got validated in 1989. I got validated, right? Validated as what? As validated. an associate of the Black Will family. But at that time, it didn't matter. Associate member, you validated, that's the rap. So from 89 to 2017, I had an indeterminate shoot, shoot term. Every time I got captured, when they put the handcuffs on, I knew I'd, I'd go straight to reception, straight back to Pelican Bay. And that's what happened. So I was there doing the hunger strikes, 2011. And um, I got released in 2012. San Diego. But look, when I went back this time, this case was, our, our, our hunger strike was successful. And we won the, uh, well, we settled the Asker versus the governor decision about us being captured as political prisoners in whole with no 115s. You said we belong to this group, but we ain't got a 115. You just came and locked us up and said we're a threat to the institutional security. And all of a sudden, I got life in the hole. You know, the judge only gave me five years. You giving me life in the hole for no crime. Your threat. Okay. I went back this time. They lifted that. Boom, I'm on the main line. Ooh. I'm on the main line. Level three. Sentinel. That shit was shocked to my system. Like, fuck. It was like being on the street. I had seasoning and shit in my food and shit, and a hot pot. Hey, I came out the hole, because when I first got back, they put me straight in, in Chino's hole until they lifted my indeterminate, like six months. Then they lifted the indeterminate, and then uh, sent me over to level three, 37 points or some shit. But, so I kind of came out the hole, I didn't have shit. So everybody gave me everything, TV, you know, fan, hot pot, all that shit. I was amazed. I had so much shit, I didn't know where to plug it at. I said, Danny, I plugged <laughs> everything. I had been in the hole so long, it was like I was a caveman. It was a trip. But they wouldn't give me a celly for a year. So I stayed there a year. Boom. Then I went to Solano. Solano was, I never met so many young Crips, so many young Bloods, so many young Barrier dudes, so many young Barrier Crips. That was just, I had so much time. And really, that's the key, man. I think that we're missing on, on this whole prison thing. Yeah, they let a lot of lifers out. But they let a lot of lifers out because they've sucked them dry. They've sucked them dry. Now, these young brothers and sisters that's coming in with all these, this time, that's the new generation. And then once they get enough of them in, they're going to change the law again, boom. Or they're going to be locked in. A certain amount of time. It's like a revolving door. It's like the recidiv it's like the, the system has recidivism. The system itself can't reform. The system itself has to eat from us. And and, and really it isn't that how it, it, it is like, like that's exactly how it is, bro. They use they use the youth. They gotta get the youth in so they can do the work that needs to be done, which is basically slavery work. You getting pennies on the dollar and uh 
and they get paid to just have you there. They get paid, prisons get paid to have you housed up in there. I don't really know exactly how or why that works, but it's because of this, the work that you do in prison. It's not all for the prison. Like, it's not just food for the prison. You're doing other work that's for this company. You're doing some other work that's for that company. You know, I don't know if they still do this or not, but I remember they used to have uh, prisoners doing license plates and stuff. It's like, that's a government job. They supposed to be doing that. Why they got people in jail doing that? And it's because it's to cut costs. It's to cut costs. Simple as that. So it is real slavery. And they need young, fit people who got energy to be able to do those jobs. Because if they got a bunch of 70, 80-year-olds, they not going to be able to get the jobs done as fast as possible. So, yeah. It is, it's just like that, man. Like, really at they the bottom paid. of this whole apparatus, on the bottom level, is the real oppressed people. The Chicano Nation. New African Nation. Puerto Rican Nation. Indigenous people. Alaska, Hawaii. These is really the foundations of what America's resting on. Because this is where she reaps her benefits from, really. Then it has this bullshit working class. You know, white people in their bullshit ass unions. Like that shit means something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> fucking unions were busted back in the fucking 20s. Oh, it's just corrupt, right? But it, it's, it's, this, this country's the Ponzi scheme. And it's predicated on our backs. So, to jump back to what you were saying about the street organization, I was a young, impressionable child. I knew right from wrong. I had been tongue kissing girls and humping them and sticking my finger in their butt for years. And I, mm -hmm. when I was eight, I had started probably doing that when I was five. You know, curiosity with girls, you know, my age and shit. You know how you were young and shit, humping girls and shit. But so, so I wasn't no naive ass dude. I knew that if I shot a dude, he wasn't gonna get back up. I knew that kind of shit. I had never shot a gun, but I had been seeing it on the cowboy movies and all the fucking war movies. And then I had been, I learned my violence from um, Looney Tunes. Man, I learned how to hit a motherfucking head with a board from um, Daffy Duck with a nail in it. I learned how to carry two guns from Yosemite Sam. Um, I learned how to carry a double barrel shotgun from Elmer Fudd. Um, I mean, did, 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 I learned how to do a drive-by from watching Al Capone movies. I, I was a young, impressionable dude. So then moving down to 69th, and mom thought she was doing the right thing. Like I love how he used cartoons along with, uh, I don't want to say real life stuff, but like real life stuff along with cartoons to display that there's multiple ways to learn how to be who you are. Some people may watch cartoons and just laugh. Some people may watch cartoons and be like, oh, this is a skill set I learned, but it's all based on your environment. So if your environment says, hey, bro, Take this shotgun, we gonna go rod. You gonna think, how the fuck am I supposed to hold? How do I hold this shotgun? Oh, I see Elmer. <laughs> like, there's all types of different ways you gonna be able to... There's, everybody sees everything different based on the perspective of the reality they live in. So, take somebody from the streets or somebody that comes from struggle or somebody that's seen a lot of crazy stuff, they gonna watch... Cartoon Network, Looney Tunes, whatever it is, and see it one way. Take somebody from, uh, you know, wealthy neighborhood, good schools. They never really see nothing bad. Great family, got money, big house, and they watch Looney Tunes. They gonna see that completely different, based on their life perspective. So I love how he threw that in there. By getting us a bigger house, she moved us from the fucking frying pan to fire and she ain't overstanding because she's just a working class mother by herself with six kids and um we took advantage of that shit we went we went latch key like a motherfucker i i, I went to ram that move for one week crazy d and my homeboy gay gay jumped on me we, we, none of us from the set then but a dude across from me asked me if i wanted this hot dog i didn't know he was already beefing with crazy d so i said yeah so when i reached for the hot dog him and D beef, and so D think I'm with him, so D get off on me, boom. Then Gay Gay jump in, they they, they pack me out. I, I, I took care of it later, don't trust me. But, um, um, okay, so I, I say, fuck it, I lock it up. I leave that school, and I go back to the school I, I was over in the Crenshaw District, 54th Street. And from that school, I graduated, sixth grade. But in sixth grade, I joined the turf. Okay, now you go to Horseman.
Talk to that. Yeah, I go to horse man. Seventh grade. Whole seventh grade, I'm a horse man. So 76, 77, I'm a horse man. But the last day of school at horse man, 76 turning 77, right around the time me took, I slapped the dean on the back of the neck on the way down the stairs. He was standing there. <laughs> it was the last day of school on Friday. And I couldn't, I, I, I had to get his neck. This motherfucker was standing there with his corduroy fucking shirt, I mean, jacket on with the patches and shit, with his hand like this, like some authority ass figure, motherfucker. And I was going downstairs and I didn't think he was gonna see me, so I reached back and got him. Bow! Slapped <laughs> the shit out of him. Bow! Hey, that's hilarious, bro. I'm gonna just say this. This is gonna be a story time for another day, but I almost went to jail my last day, second to last day. It was either second to last day or last day of sixth grade. Yeah, I was in sixth grade. Yeah, I almost went to jail. <laughs> me and me and two other homies, man, for some stupid stuff we did, thinking we was hard. Story time for another day. If you want to hear it, get at me in the comments. Let me know. I gave him the whole hand on his white ass neck. Bam! And I dug down the crowd and I jetted. But the whole summer, that fool hunted me and got all his informants. Then the first day of school, he was at the gate. And he said, Cody Scott, come here. Come on. Grabbed him by the shoulder, took me in, expelled me. Not expelled me from the school district, you know, suspended me. So, and kicked me out of school. I went to Henry Clay. And this is how I hooked up with the Hoovers. I went to Henry Clay, 77. So, I landed Henry Clay. Just so happened they put me in the, in the fucking uh, 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 class. With Ben O's from 107, Levi from 107, Moo Moo's little brother An, Andre Jones from 107. I mean, some solid dudes, because I really didn't know who was from blocks or neighbors. I think my dad went to Henry Clay. Middle school? I know he went to Washington High. I think my pops went to Henry Clay. I wonder, look at every, he said Dinker, right? I wonder if my pops know this dude or grew up around him now that i'm thinking about it they low-key grew up in the same area and they close to age i think he might be older though i think he might be like some years older than my pops but i'm curious now it was dang who he was beefing with this is like 77 and it wasn't no crit wars i'm still over enthused by these giants like cutes rusty mouse chuck chucky Todd, I mean, you know, fuck, man. Lil Chuck, Wayne, uh, Loose Booty, T-Bone, All Head Mike, Loose Booty, KC. Y'all got a dude in your crew named Loose Booty? I mean, these dudes local Raymond Potts, James Miller, the Bram Killer. I mean, these is fucking local fucking legends, right? And so these names is like, to me, like collecting baseball cards. And I would see their name on the wall and it would say Cutes, 38 Special. He signed his name and then put the kind of gun. But the thing about them was they, they had a clique called the Magnificent Seven. All right, man. Hey, that was it. That was part one, man. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this already, bro. I'm enjoying this already. I'm learning some stuff. We, we, we just talking about what's going on, man. Hopefully, if you guys enjoyed that, hit that like button, subscribe. Get at me in the comments, man. Let me know what you think. Be on the lookout. Part two of this interview is going to be coming uh, either later this week, but most likely probably same time next week. So be on the lookout for that, man. And that's it. I love y'all. Appreciate y'all. Remember to keep it real, 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 real. Always reaches everyone next time. Peace.